let yourself be silently drawn by the strange pull of what you really love. It will not lead you astray. Born in Lancashire in 1953, Kenneth studied for seven years in the Catholic seminary before turning his attention to the arts. He attended the Banbury School of Art and then the London College of Printing, where he identified his passion for photography. Kenna first visited Japan in 1987. The landscape completely captured his imagination. He has been visiting ever since. So a few weeks ago, I was lucky enough to go to my first Kenna exhibit in London, and I picked up this copy of Forms of Japan. Um, Michael was in in the exhibit a few days before, signing a few copies, so that's quite cool. Um, but I thought today I would just have a little flick through the book and talk about some of the theories, philosophies, uh, creative processes that I think are going on behind Michael's work, um, especially over in Japan. And I'm not going to flick through the whole book. It is 300 pages long, and there's quite a few essays as well, which are definitely well worth a read. I think they're very well written, um, but I'm going to go through sort of some of my favorite parts. I've been poring over this book for probably the last week or so. And yeah, I think it's having a, a real impact on me and I wanted to share that with a few of you. We start off with what Michael is probably most well known for is one of these lone trees. I've seen thing is predominantly square format. It's all black and white. Um, and I say predominantly, as we'll see, there's a few uh, aspect ratio changes, which is part of the interesting thing that's going on here with the way that he's sequencing the images within the book. Um, there's also a few quotes and um, also haikus that he pairs with the images, which I really appreciate. And we'll touch on that a little bit more as we go through. The book's also split up into five main sections, uh, sea land, trees, spirit, and sky. And for a volume of work this dense, I think that's just about uh, the right amount of photographs per section. Um, but I'll touch on that as well as we flick through the book. So we start with sky, and um, a lot of Michael's work utilizes very long exposures to produce a sort of solitude and simplicity in his work. Um, here he's photographing over uh, the sea, and of course that super long exposure here, 12 hours, um, completely smooths out the ocean. So he's sort of emphasizing that sense of uh, calm and solitude. And of course, as I said, there is uh, some essays, which I'll gloss over for now, but they are well worth read if you do pick up a copy of the book. Starting with sea, I think, was a great choice because it really emphasizes that Japan is, of course, an island. It's surrounded on all coasts by uh, vast swathes of ocean. So the feeling that one gets across the sequencing of images uh, really lends itself to establishing a sort of narrative of the land and ocean. And of course, Michael also incorporates uh, man-made objects in his photographs. He's always looking for that little touch of the human element in his images. The other thing, if I uh, just center up here and zoom in on this photograph a little bit, is his ability to create variation in his compositions, uh, even though they're all of square compositions. Everything here obviously set off to the left-hand side and there's just something magical about that sort of asymmetry, the unbalanced nature of his uh, compositions. And I think it all ties back to a Zen philosophy that he has studied. Um, very often the unbalanced is actually seen as quite beautiful in Japanese philosophy, especially if we look to things like wabi-sabi and um, other other Zen practices. Yeah, the Tori Gates here is another big part of Shinto Buddhism. So essentially the deities are seen as part of the landscape 
And these gates are a way of um, accessing that sort of spiritual connection with the gods. So Michael's basically emphasizing the sense of reverence and honor for the landscape. And here with the subtle change to a much wider format, Michael's using uh, this to break up that monotony of everything being square, black and white. And I think this is quite a clever device in the book, just to keep things interesting, uh, visually interesting, keep the viewer engaged with the photographs. Another thing that Michael does here is he shoots almost everything in this all this soft, diffused light. You'll notice a lot of the images that include sky are uh, heavily overcast. And if he is shooting here with clear skies, it's usually in the blue hour, or he's doing some sort of very long exposure to produce that effect of a soft, diffused light. And it all goes back to um, creating something that feels very, very calming and something of solitude. So moving on to the land section, we get this sudden shift to a very black, a single streak of white running through the image, followed by, shortly after the essay, almost the inverse image, where it's just little streaks of black through an entirely white photograph. Um, and this sequencing here really reflects the change that Japan had on Michael as an artist. In an interview, he said that it, visiting Japan um, effectively entirely changed his outlook on photography. And he shifted more towards these kinds of photographs, where he feels as though he's starting with a blank canvas, and then each element within the frame is like the stroke of a calligrapher's ink brush, uh, just slowly adding element by element in a very intentional manner. I really enjoy these studies. You get a sort of almost an insight into the inner workings of the photographer and how he is trying different compositions, uh, often with very diagonal elements. And again, he's using a sense of complete change in photographic composition here, something very flat on, as opposed to those diagonal dynamic elements that provide us with depth. So in that way, he's providing us with compositional contrast, contrast in ideas, and um, a variety within the book that keeps the viewer interested. Again, we see man-made elements within the landscape. These here are some um, fishing cages, I believe, as well as grain silos. Perhaps Michael's best known for his work, photographing the sort of minimalist style with uh, solo trees. And there's a lot of that in this book here. We see the cover image um, paired with haikus that I'm just gonna touch on. And again, we see the Biwa Lake tree study photographed over uh, a sequence of more than 10 years. So this pairing with uh, haikus and poetry is reinforcing the idea that Michael's work goes beyond just the image itself. It's really trying to speak to the unseen in the landscape, that connection, spiritual connection with uh, the deities or a sort of reverence to the landscape. Um, and by pairing it directly with these haikus, He's referencing that his photographs are, in fact, sort of visual poems of the landscape. I mean, the work in here and the quality of the printing as well is phenomenal. Pristel Press, who published this book, has done a really, really good job. This is perhaps one of my favorite 
images in the book, actually, this uh, pine tree out in the snowstorm. I think perhaps because it reminds me slightly of uh, some trees that I get up in Scotland. <laughs> it's done an interesting thing here, though, where he's included this slice of hill in the foreground and it sort of cuts the tree off before it reaches the bottom of the frame. Um, so yeah, it gives sort of the effect of this tree isolated within the center of the frame, almost floating in dead space. Some fantastic work here. Um, but I'll move on to the next section of the book, which is spirit. Some people might be slightly surprised to find some of this work in here, quite a urban documentary work almost. Um, however, it forms what becomes quite a crucial part of the narrative of the book. Um, of course, some of Michael's backstory is that he studied in a seminary for seven years to become a Catholic priest. Um, so this relationship with religion and spirituality has sort of a deep seated, um, has deep roots within Michael as a person. It becomes very personal work and something that the viewer really has to create their own personal connection with as well. Sort of in a way it forces itself upon you to think deeper about the relationship of the spirit within uh, or the human connection with the spirit and with the landscape. Some of these foggy scenes are just, uh, wow, they're really beautiful. I mean, I don't typically look at urban, urban landscapes, if you will, um, but I really did actually enjoy this section of the book. And while he doesn't really include um, human figures directly, it's again, it's that allusion to uh, the human element within the landscape. And I think the, uh, the length of some of these sections is probably just about right. So you start to go through them and just as they are starting to, I guess, stretch their legs a little bit too far, you move on to the next section and uh, the subject matter changes entirely. So you really can uh, get fully engrossed into this book. And I like that it ends on uh, sky here. It's sort of the most elusive, as they talk about in the book, uh, which reinforces that statement that Kenna is trying to photograph the unseen uh, and the suggested. And there's, of course, some return to previous subject matter, but, a, but photographed in an entirely different way. And it begins to mean something else to the viewer. It involves the viewer's imagination. You're referencing yourself back to the previous images, and now you've got new context to bring to your experience of this photograph. So he's got a brilliant way of involving the viewer in the images um, and asking them to bring their own imagination to this uh, experience. His sky photographs really do bring to light that he likes this soft diffused light um, that is found often with more heavily overcast uh, conditions. But the way that he's able to manipulate the tones to provide highlights, contrast, deep rich shadows is something that I'm definitely learning to try and apply in my own photography.
And the final image of the book, perhaps one that's only slightly confusing, um, but I think on purpose, is this uh, strange double or triple exposure of Tory gates, sky, snow, trees, um, sort of encapsulating the whole book into a single frame, leaving the viewer asking questions rather than with resolute answers. And I do like that he's included a selected reading list here of resources to continue your journey into learning more about Japan, Japanese philosophy, um, haikus, poetry, art in general. Um, that's something that I really appreciate. And there's a few in here that I've already read, uh, but there's also equally a few that have gone onto the reading list. And there we have it. A really beautiful book from Michael Kenna, and I do strongly recommend that you either check out this book, pick it up, or uh, just take a look at Michael's work yourself.